Um, I have to give huge, huge, huge props to Jessica Hyde from Magnet Forensics, who's a really good friend of mine, one of the most amazing and awesome people on the planet. If you ever have the privilege of sitting down uh, with her and sharing a tasty beverage, I will tell you, she is one of those individuals that is just full of ideas and just spark. She came to us and said, I have you know, a brilliant idea of who we can uh, you, use for a keynote. And it was Matt Mitchell. Um, so Matt is a hacker and tech fellow at the Ford Foundation, is working with build and technology and society teams at the Ford Foundation to develop digital security strategy, technical assistance offerings, and safety and security measures for the foundation's grantee partners. Matt's committed to using his digital skills as a hacker, developer, operational security trainer, security researcher, and data journalist. Matt has worked in various capacities at the intersection of technology and social justice. Matt is probably well known for as a security researcher, operational trainer, data journalist who leads and founded Crypto Harlem, which is an impromptu workshops to, uh, teaching basic crypt crypto tools and skills to predominantly African-American community in Upper Manhattan. Uh, he spends his free time uh, training activists in operational information security. His personal work focuses on marginalized, aggressively monitored, and over-policed populations in the United States. Uh, Matt was a tech advisor to the Human Rights Foundation, as well as a member of the advisory board to the Open Technology Fund, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and the Internet Freedom Festival. I really am excited uh, to hear Matt's presentation this morning. So please give a warm welcome uh, to welcome Matt as he presents a different side of DFIR, forensicating for Black Lives and other social justice issues. Matt? Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. Okay, that's good. Uh, whoa. Okay. Ooh. Right down there in the back. Thank you so much. Um, Hello. Hello, everyone out there. Good morning. Good day. Dobra den. Ni hao. Konbanwa and guten tag. I realized really close to the stepping up on this virtual stage that there are tens of thousands of people registered. Uh, this world is a big place. Some of you are listening and watching these talks from uh, in the late night, some of you in the early morning, uh, some of you in the middle of your day. And I just want to say thank you for being here. Before I begin, the, view, the views I'm expressing are mine. Um, they're not in, there are no endorsements here. Uh, I speak as Matt, not as an employee of Ford Foundation. Ford Foundation is amazing. Um, I don't have any slides, so you can just crank up my voice if you want to jump into the Discord. And uh, I'll ask you to, you know, grab your favorite case management tool or text editor or whatever you got around. You can make some observations. You can, uh, you know, also write with pen and paper. That works too. I have an ask of you, so I will recruit you to an awesome cause. So be prepared for that. And I have a challenge for you, but all that's later. Um, you know, as you've already heard, I used to work as a software engineer and application security a developer, a data journalist. Um, I used to be at CNN, New York Times, a lot of different news <laughs> uh, and media organizations in the past, but that was a long time ago. And I'm here to talk to you about what I'm doing now and maybe what you might think about doing. Uh, first of all, I have to tell you how honored I am to speak at a SANS event. For me, SANS is breakfast, uh, quite literally. So um, thank you to SANS, thank you, um, Phil and Heather and Robert, thanks to the amazing advisors to uh, the D4 Summit. You know, thanks for meeting this challenging time also with innovation and flexibility. And we are all at the largest SANS event in history because of your efforts. And that's, that's amazing. So again, uh, my name is Matt. Um, as you can tell, I'm super honored to be here. Whenever I meet people, who are interested in this field, I always tell them, no matter whether you wanna go into red team or blue team or purple team, whether you wanna get into digital forensics, you should check out the SANS Internet Storm Center because it's every day and it's really short. So you can spend five to 10 minutes listening to it. And I, I love it because I always ask myself, what would I do if this was me? 
right? What would I do if I was at Twitter security right now? Like, um, and you can see how the incidents unfold and go back later and, and, and fix those things, okay? So um, yeah, I, I, I always think like, what if this happened on my watch, okay? Um, okay, so that's, that's great and everything, but that who are you, right? Uh, I'm a hacker. However, I'm a hacker who works in service of civil society. And what is that? Because civil society is not a normal term that you might use every day, but I do <laughs> in my line of work. Um, it's the ecosystem of all the different good works and efforts of educational institutions, grant makers, nonprofits, non-governmental organizations, uh, funders, et cetera. And we just call it, them all civil society organizations. And there's a lot of great work that happens on this planet that's done by regular people, friends and neighbors, governments. Um, civil society is the connective tissue, I think, that makes sure that we all can like rise up together with a, a motivation that's pretty neutral. Um, you know, I'm the child of immigrants. My dad, he's an electrician amongst other things because I'm from the Caribbean. So we have many, many jobs. Uh, work ethic is high. Immigrants get the job done, all that good stuff. Uh, and, you know, he would take apart tools and things that he found when he was working, uh, equipment. And I, as a child, would take apart my toys and watch him put everything back together on his side. And I sat there with a bunch of broken toys. But it got me curious, got me curious to think, like, what is inside of things? What makes up things? And, and how do we take them apart? And when I saw my first computer, I was mystified and... That was it. I knew that this is something that I would do forever. Um, early in my life, everything was pretty chill. We, we moved to this country uh, from England and um, then came October, 1983. And what happened then was the US invasion of Grenada. In that American forces uh, lost 19 uh, Marines military 116 troops uh, on the American side were, were wounded. Uh, Grenadian forces lost 45 people who were dead and over uh, 300, almost 400 wounded. 24 civilians were killed, including an incident where um, a mental hospital was accidentally bombed. And this is all in a country that, uh, I mean, it's so small. Um, the population of the entire country is 96,000 people. And while this might be a blip in American history or maybe something people aren't familiar with, in my family and in my world, it changed a lot for me. And one thing I remember that was most confusing was the folks on TV were mispronouncing the island, Granada, the, the villages and towns and cities. And I was like, well, if they're not right, if I'm hearing different messages from family and friends over the phone, like what is truth anyway, right? And I think all this to say, you know, in DFER, we're always seeking out truth, right? Uh, what is ground truth? What is the, 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 the forensically verifiable truth that the data leads us to? Fast forward to my first real job. And my first real job was working at a, a research facility. Um, it was for a very, very big company. Uh, I was working on a team and we were doing like massive rollouts of like machines to all the different scientists and researchers and all the folks at this space. And um, it was a sprawling campus, insane. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. I didn't know things like this existed. I came up with a lot of cool tricks to get these images cloned and deployed and serialized and still personalized. And uh, my team was amazed because we automated, or I should say I automated <laughs> um, a lot of the things so they can take a really long lunch break. But I was fascinated. I always wanted to get things working better. And I remember one of the people we reported to said, hey, Matt, maybe you should work with the monitors. And I thought, why would I want to lift up these heavy CRT monitors. Things are huge, right? This is not the days of flat screen, but that's not what they meant. They meant uh, a team that was kind of the, 
the hybrid of uh, PR, security, and IT, and that was the employee monitoring team, employee tracking team. We had software that was built from the ground up for us. Um, we contracted out. And uh, I was like, okay, what is this stuff? And I had no idea that this was a thing. Um, there is an article actually in the Washington Post now that we live in the days of COVID-19. It's called something like managers turn to surveillance software, always on webcams to ensure employees are really working. Um, there's nothing new about this, right? There's, there's this idea that work is an exchange of time for money and efficiencies and performance. And, um, you know, it's great that you can trust people, but maybe some people are working hard quietly. Maybe some people are working hard loud. This is a way that you can check on what's going on. And you also can protect yourself from insider threats, et cetera. But I didn't feel cool or powerful. I felt creeped out and wrong. I looked into like, you know, how all this stuff worked and, and how we, these, this code was working. I kind of unpacked it, reverse engineered it. I just needed to understand more about this. Like how, I mean, I, I look, realized that everyone who worked there had signed an agreement and somewhere in there it said like, this is fine. And my team version of the software must've been a lemon. Something was wrong and the folks that we watched never seemed to do anything wrong. I don't know what happened. Um, but it, it made me realize that there's a lot of stuff out there and this thing that I love, which is technology that I don't necessarily agree with. And when that happens, my performance isn't as awesome as it should be. I love solving puzzles and I know so many of you love solving puzzles. But um, only, only when they help people does it really resonate for me, right? Only when my work is really assisting a greater good do I feel that's what gets me out of bed. That's what makes me work in a rainy day or with a headache. And I think that's true for so, much, so many forensicators out there, right, who uh, regardless of how you're working, your motivation is the same. Um, one of like goodwill, one of protection, um, one of, of safety and concern. You know, whether you're hunting down the, the, the bad guys uh, who target nations or the bad guys who target children, a lot of the work is still the same. It's, it's, uh, it could be building cases, it could be finding suspects, it could be protecting corporations and their patents. A lot of the work is with this idea that what we're doing is for the best and for the good. And uh, I was talking to my friend Jessica who said, uh, you know, forensicators see themselves, and we, I think in the conversation we said, uh, unbiased arbitrators of truth. And that's a really great place to, to see yourself. But oftentimes when you zoom out, there are things that we don't control that affect our ability to take that stance. And that might be the office that you're working inside of or the, you know, the, the, the workflow or framework you're in, you're in, the country that you're in, the rules of that nation, the ethics or lack of ethics that are associated with your profession where you are. It's really hard for an individual to draw that line. For an, I mean, it's probably the most difficult thing to say, well, wait, I'm not sure if I agree with what's going on here. I know exactly what that's like, as I've said from my personal experience. You do so much and I'm actually using this platform to ask you to do a little bit more, um, maybe a little bit different or, or different. So I, well, I'm going to spare you with a laugh track because even I didn't like that joke. But um, what kind of impact could you make if you used your skills, these amazing skills that you've amassed over cases and years in a very different place? And it is common for some forensicators to assist their peers in other countries, in other jurisdictions, in other areas, to even volunteer their services to domestic violence shelters, to survivors of abuse. And I'm talking about even a, a larger distance traveled in taking our work to the next level not something that's even so closely associated with the work you do each day. And I think if you do this, 
as I've experimented and seen, it really gives me new life and energy for the day-to-day -day work. So I currently work at Ford Foundation as a, a public interest technologist is what we call it. And um, you might have heard of public interest law. And this is an idea that many philanthropies, many funders are trying to create a field where technologists and people with a passion for forensics and digital security, incident response, cybersecurity, don't go to the usual suspects, which would maybe be like a large tech company or a tech platform like Twitter, where you're very busy if you work there right now, um, or even to the government or the military. Ford Foundation is a philanthropy, if you're not familiar, that sits on a $13 billion endowment. And of that money, Ford Foundation gives about at least like 400 million a year to fight against inequality. On our very new website, it says, justice begins where inequality ends. And I get to wake up every day and just push back against inequality on a, in a global sense. And no matter what your viewpoints are, I think inequality is something that you can say, yeah, I don't like that. I want to change that. And I've only been there since the last fall. And I've already traveled to many parts of the world and talked to practitioners who do work similar to the work that you do. But there's a big gap, right? These are folks who are very skilled in protecting dissidents, journalists, human rights defenders from the worst of the worst that they know, but not the ones that they don't know. And forensics is probably the Achilles heel of most of these networks. I had the benefit of traveling through Latin America, the Middle East, parts of the States in this short period of time. And time and time again, I realized that a lot of the groups that are doing this work, their understanding of forensics is not where it needs to be. There's so much room for improvement and that can be where you come in. I worked at a great organization called Tactical Tech. Uh, they're based in Berlin and um, I was the director of digital security and safety there and privacy stuff. And, you know, they put out something called holistic security. I would definitely recommend checking it out. It's really interesting because it's such a different viewpoint on some of the same things that we hold as our foundation but it's coming from the space of activism and grassroots. And I think that uh, taking a look at that would be like really interesting and eye-opening to many of you, if you have the time. You know, I've consulted with organizations all over this world and I've just felt like, you know what, in my role, no matter what I was doing, I was just addressing a symptom. I wasn't, I wasn't working on the, the main cause. And it reminded me of the work I did as a child, as a teenager working at soup kitchens, because it's like, I know what it's like to be hungry. I don't want you to be hungry, but tomorrow hunger finds you and you have to come back. And then you bring a friend, but then they have to come back. And um, it is good work and it is meaningful work, but working on the digital security, cybersecurity front lines, meeting people in country where they were, while gratifying, it just felt like the next job was right behind the one I was about to finish. And the next person I would protect it, and the stakes are very high, it can include disappearance, death, detainment or arrest for insane amounts of time. Uh, not everyone has the same legal system around this planet. And um, I just felt, you know, maybe if I work on a different way, leave the people who are doing that, my peers at the time, continue this good fight, I'm just going to take it and try to move the needle a little bit on the greater cause. And that's what Ford Foundation really allows me to do. And I really appreciate that every single day. So I also have this social justice part of my talk. So let me jump into this. You know, there's a, uh, a TED talk by an individual named Michael Kimmel. And he's a scholar of men. It's kind of interesting title, a scholar of masculinity. Um, the talk is called why gender equality is good for everyone. And in this like conversation, he goes into this moment that he says changed his life. 
He was a grad student. He was in a study group. It was on feminist theory. And there was a conversation between a black woman and a white woman on his, in his study group, right? As his potluck. And the white woman talked about oppression of women and how it links all women in a kind of sisterhood, a kind of sheared um, adversity. But the black woman said something along the lines of, I'm not sure about that. And uh, so that obviously is like, well, very striking, provocative. So it's like, well, and, the, and then she says, what do you see to her white counterpart when you look in the mirror? And the white woman said, I see myself, I see a woman. And the black woman said, that's the problem, right? When I look in the mirror, I see a black woman. Because to me, race is visible, but to you, it is invisible. Um, and that's how privilege works. That's what she said. She said, it's invisible to those who have it. And when I listened to that for the first time, I thought, wow, that's really powerful. And I thought about all the different ways where things in this world were invisible to me, the size of this world, the struggles of places, the commonalities we all share. Um, even like booking a business trip, I could just decide where I wanted to go, how long the trip was and how much it cost. While many of my colleagues were wrestling with visa requirements and restrictions and, and how would it look to have that stamp in their passport and all these other things. And I had like a passport privilege. It's a different experience. There are things that we don't see. Um, and, you know, they, these things, a lot of them, we have power to change and they offer quite rewarding puzzles. And we are a community of, at the end, people really love these kind of logical challenges. I feel like no matter who you are, no matter what you care about, there are ways that you can connect to this drive to creation of public interest technology as a field. It doesn't mean that you leave your job, although that would be awesome. Uh, it, it could mean maybe at the end of your career, you switch it up. But it also means that there are inroads for you to work now for a few hours or a few days or a few weeks, and we're building those at Ford Foundation. I feel like no matter what you're passionate about, apply your skills to that. And that's how I find myself working in defense of black lives. Find something that you see that others don't. When you look in your mirror, right? Find things that are associated with maybe your identity or maybe your interest or your passions, maybe your faith or lack thereof, whatever it is, work towards doing that good thing. So even though you're just waking up and getting your coffee or some of you are ending your days, take a deep breath, stretch it all out, energize yourself. And that's my challenge to you. How can we use our skills to forensicate differently? I've been to places where protesting is illegal, where any kind of speech against what is the, the um, status quo, any kind of dissent is crushed. I don't want anything like that where I live. And that's what led me to work with black led organizations pushing for civil rights and racial justice. For me, this advice meant that. For you, it can mean something very different. One of the people who are in the space of nonprofit NGO civil society actors that do great work are Citizen Lab. And the lab is run by a gentleman named Ron Debert, and they also happen to be a grantee of Ford. They do forensics in this different way. They do forensics mapping malware, stalkerware, data exfiltration, weapons, hackers for hire, large companies that are peddling these things, tracing it all, mapping it, researching it. In a recent report they call Dark Basin, which I definitely recommend you check out, they spent years looking at a hack for hire operation that went after journalists, lawyers, nonprofits, and funders. And it's the kind of thing where it's not the job of an amazing select team. It's the kind of thing where every region and every location should have something like the lab does at the University of Toronto, uh, Monk School of Foreign Affairs. And 
because there's so many of you out there, probabilities on my side. And if I would like to see whether you're in India or Japan or Indonesia or the US, that you think about what can I do to build this new kind of forensics or assist the people who are already doing this work. I have hope and see amazing things at the University of Berkeley. They have a thing there called the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And in it, there's one program called Citizen Clinic, which gets students on board to take up this task. And these students, are exposed to real world threats where they get amazing experience. And so when they go on to their careers, when they leave grad school, maybe they go into defense, maybe they go into uh, the commercial sector, the private sector, maybe they go into their own practice, they have skills that none of their peers would ever have because the threats that face civil society and nonprofit organizations are so unique, right? And there's a real connection between digital crimes on that end and real physical crimes and serious ones which like murder and, 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 and disappearance. A friend of mine, she takes up this challenge in her own way. She's a very gifted pen tester and she works in assistance in deploying sensors with spectrograms and audio measuring and some mapping capability in African countries that are looking at uh, primates, and gorillas, uh, animals that are on endangered species list, things that we might not realize technology can be used to solve a very old problem, poaching. It's not her full-time job, but one hour or one day a week or one day a month of her time changes the trajectory of the good work of these folks who do this every day in a way that you cannot believe. It, it amplifies their work like no funding can. So social justice, whether it's black lives or other causes, whatever you believe, I'm asking you to find a way to give back. And I'm gonna help you a little bit, a little bit of a mapping, a little bit of a, a options and ways to think on how to get started. Cause this isn't the first time I've reached back to this amazing community and brought up the work I do and some of the amazing people in this work. But I also seen the challenges that you'll find when you are trying to begin this journey or maintain a project or meet other people, form a cohort. I know that next year at SANS DFER Summit 2021, I wanna, I wanna have a presentation on all the amazing ideas that you came up with, the community that's forced to just listen to these words at this moment. So if you could meet me in the um, Discord, right? I'll be here today, I'll be here tomorrow. I'll be checking it out. I would love to connect you. If you feel like, hey, you know what? How small a commitment of time do I need? Or how large can it be? Or what can the conversation be? I'm happy to talk to you about that. Some of the obvious things that come to mind are the embattled Open Technology Fund, um, Open Tech, that fund is a, a funder of open source projects of any like, right? Um, the idea is if this technology is open source and it's fighting repression outside the United States, they will invest in it. And it's part of the um, money that's, that's generated for OTF comes from tax dollars, right? And uh, currently they are fighting for their lives and trying to maintain an independent unbiased and balanced organization. And I wish them the greats of luck. Please educate yourself on Open Tech Fund. They, if they make it out of their current uh, issues, they might be your first funder, right? They might be your first support. They offer um, a red team that can just look at a tool and you know it's hard to get an audit. It's expensive to get an audit and they will cover that for you. They'll walk you through that. They'll help you assist and secure the product that you're working on or the idea that you have or the lessons that you're generating. Um, and, you know, some really, really big names in the field, you know, like include security and uh, Cure 53, NCC group, Subgraph, others. Now, I talked about Ford Foundation, all the amazing things Ford Foundation is doing. Well, there's a project called NetGain. 
because this is, you know, for a lot of reasons, like a lot of play on words, but I, I see it as this is a win-win for everyone. Um, this idea of developing the field of public interest technology, Knight Foundation, Open Society Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, Mozilla Foundation and Ford have created this net gain program and they've all pitched in money to the amount of millions, but also the idea that we'll share ideas and have a coordinated effort to solve these problems and to support this field, which means supporting you on accepting this challenge. Mozilla, which is known for Firefox, the browser, is a nonprofit that owns a corporation. And the Mozilla has a thing called the MOSS or MOSS, the Mozilla Open Source Support Program. And they will allow you to get an idea in, a board will look at it, and if they agree like, hey, this is a great idea, it's open source and you're doing good work, they will help you fund that idea. There's no strings attached, it's not like venture capitalism, it's not like tech for good. Um, this is what their mission is, this is what they do every year, and you should definitely check it out. And lastly, I will talk about the NGO ISAC that I'm a new member in. It's so exciting to be there with other non-governmental organizations. As you know already, an ISAC is an information sharing and analysis center. And in this ISAC, we can share threats. We can talk about the commonalities. Um, you know, working in the defense of grantees of a foundation, you see so many um, varied attacks, very sophisticated. I mean, definitely APT level sophistication ongoing um, for financial gain or more most likely to to dissuade and deter and slow down the great progress of some of these organizations and being in that ISAC I learned so much every day we share indicators of compromise and fingerprints and 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 strategies and it's really exciting work so I want to end here um, I see some of you are moving around in your virtual seats and I would love to take questions if we have them. Otherwise, I could talk all day. So thank you so much, Sans. Thank you to all of you who are listening to me. It's an amazing agenda today. Uh, so many great talks. I can't wait to just circle back in and become an attendee and let's level up my mind. Knowledge is power and thank you for empowering all of us. Be careful, be safe out there. That's excellent. Very, very uh, good information. Thank you for sharing your perspective and your experience. And, uh, you know, we, we were talking uh, in a couple of the chat channels while you were while you were speaking, and I'm kind of letting a few of the questions come in through the, uh, the Q&A here. Um, and it's really just the kind of thing where a lot of times we look at what's going on in the world and try and figure out, well, what can what can we do? And especially from a technology perspective, it's really fascinating to hear, you know, what is being done not just what the potential is but um, but what you're doing and what your, your organizations and colleagues are doing and certainly try and inspire us to uh, to find ways that we can contribute as well um and looking through some of the questions here um try and take a look through and uh in terms of contact information for anybody that wants to engage do you have a, a twitter handle or what's your preferred means of, of communication there yeah there's um uh, on Twitter, I'm Gemini with an extra I at the end, Matt, M-A-T-T. -T. So if you go to G-E-M-I-N-I-I-M-A-T-T, -T, that's me. I'm always, I have open DMs and I'm always happy to follow you, to talk to you or learn more. I, there's a Medium post, um, how to reach Matt Mitchell privately or how to reach Matt Mitchell uh, securely. And that's every way you can reach me. Uh, you can contact me anonymously. You can contact me uh, your email, etc. My number one platform is this um, probably not well known to this group um, communication uh, app called Wire. But I love Wire; it's pretty cool. And um, you know that's probably the best way. So look, I I have um, uh, an amazing admin. Thank you, Raven, who uh, helps schedule time. I love meeting people who just want to learn more about this stuff. That's how it starts. Absolutely. And sometimes it just takes that one kind of uh, that spark of interest and, and kind of hearing hearing somebody else's perspective and experience to really kind of grow that that interest, uh, you know, very rapidly. Um, so hopefully that this is going to serve that purpose for, for some of our attendees. 
Um, good question here. And I know you touched on a couple of these uh, during your talk, but maybe just a little bit more to the extent that you can expand. Um, specifically when it comes to digital forensics incident response. Um, I was wondering, there's an attendee that was wondering if you might be able to share some specific DFIR implementation, or not implementation, but effects um, in your experience. Yeah, so um, I'll talk about maybe the unveiling of the Pegasus software, let's say, right? So in we have in our spaces, civil society spaces, a group called Access Now, they're a nonprofit, and they're known for this thing called the Access Now Helpline. And what that is, is a group of people around the world, so they always can field your questions, and activists, human rights defenders, journalists, anyone who needs assistance um, can write them an email, encrypted or not, and get a response. Usually, I think they say something like um, two days or something like that, but I've never met anyone who had to wait that long. And what they noticed were groups that had nothing to do with each other, journalists, lawyers, activists in different countries of this planet with similar, um, what looked like phishing emails, phishing WhatsApp messages, um, symptoms of, of strange activity on their phone and glitches. And they were like, you know, we're not experts on this, right? We're not gonna have the resources to take the time to analyze this. Let's push it up to Citizen Lab, which I talked about um, in my presentation. Citizen Lab reached out to these individuals and got their phones, got images of their devices. Uh, we're able to take a look at uh, you know, whether you're on an iPhone or Android, or, um, your operating system, or what, um, what changes there are to your memory, um, you know, do some analysis of memory, do some analysis of uh, network activity. And they noticed unusual pings, very short, small ones, to an IP address. And what this led to was the unveiling of a malware, um, very expensive piece of malware called Pegasus which took advantage of, um, you know, not quite a zero day, but a, a very large vulnerability in iOS, um, iOS devices. And upon that one user action of clicking or following, the perpetrator would be able to access camera, phone, location, et cetera. And there was no defense against that. Once you clicked it, it was over. And um, what the lab was able to do was show this through forensics, right? So um, Bill at Citizen Lab um, uh, uh, and John at, at Citizen Lab and the rest of the team there, Adam, et cetera, um, are experts on how can we, because it's difficult to point the finger at a, a multi-million dollar uh, company like NSO Group and say, hey, we think that you're building tools that are hurting, in this case, um, uh, anti-sugar activist uh, in Mexico, people who are talking about changing to a tax or a bill or a law, but what does that actually do? To them, they believe this is just a nice, good thing, but millions of dollars could be lost by governments or by companies because of these decisions to just change from a healthy diet, et cetera. And so um, the NSO group was employed to track these individuals, find out what they're planning, what they're doing. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm I'm happy to go into the details more, but um, there are many cases like this. And there are also strange things that like I see where people who are taking part in the protests that we see, either uh, you know, on one, one side of like, hey, this is what I care about, or the other side of like, well, this is what I care about. I just want to meet in the middle and talk and converse. Um, they're having strange, they're reporting strange activity on their phones. Um, maybe it's their phone seems to drop off the network, right? So is there a signal jammer? Is there malware? Um, is it something that comes, caused from a, um, a cell site uh, simulator? Uh, is, it, is it something else? Is it new? And these are things that uh, myself and other people who do this work, we speak about it all the time. We share this information. We go through it, the details of it. You, uh, if you're hearing my voice, you would be a, a great, great, um, great person to, to bounce ideas off of. It's really unique and interesting, the things that you see. It's very different from what you might see if you work um, you know, in, in the ideal of legal capacity. You know? um, I could talk about the work I've done 
with people who are like, you know what, I'm a survivor. I have a Me Too story. I'm concerned about my myself. I'm concerned about my family. I'm concerned about my privacy. Uh, I want to be able to talk and say something, but I, I'm concerned about a lot of these issues. And I'll look into their devices. I'll look into, um, you know, the whole ecosystem of technology around them. And what you do find is when you are speaking truth to power or, um, you know, making an accusation or telling a truth, oftentimes that's expensive to someone and it's worth the money to hire an investigative team, a hack for hire operation, a malware developer to um, go after those individuals. And sometimes we can bring it right to the adversary's footsteps and you know, there's some attribution that can be done. And other times it's quite difficult. You can defend your client, you can help support and these individuals, but it's, it's so difficult to figure out what is this a larger part of? And that's why it takes many years for these kinds of forensics to, um, to, to point to something, right? Great question. Excellent. That's, uh, you know, th there's another question that came in that actually I think dovetails really nicely to, uh, to a little bit of what you were just saying there. Um, let me scroll to the right question so I, I capture the, the essence correctly. Um, do you have any, any guidance or suggestions for resources where somebody who is interested could potentially go to find out where there might be an entry into, uh, you know, helping with some of these organizations, um, you know, whether it be Citizen Labs or Open Tech Fund or, or any of the others that you had mentioned, like, is, is there a clearinghouse for those kinds of opportunities, I guess? And I would say there's not a one-stop shop. Um, I see a lot of interesting opportunities on the website for the Internet Freedom Festival. And it's global, it's international, so that's a nice place to look at. They have a job board, it's called, but it's mostly different things, which could be fellowships, it could be, uh, like you can take, like when I was working nine to five, I would find myself like, oh, I wanna, I wanna help a little bit. I mean, I have a full-time job and I have other things I wanna do in my life. And uh, you can work as a fellow, you can work um, in, in counsel and support, you could work on an advisor, an advisory role to a board of an organization. And I found many of them to the um, Internet Freedom Festival. In my, in my work through for, um, as an advisor when I was doing that for National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, I was like, oh, you know, like who helps a lot in this field? And I wasn't sure, so I reached out to, um, luckily I have a pretty large network, so I reached out to people who are doing amazing work who I read about, right? And I was like, oh, hey, I'm Matt. Hey, someone can introduce me to this individual. And I was like, well, who's doing good work on the ground about this issue? And it was just that easy. Many of the same groups came up over and over again. And that was one where I fit in quite well. And I assisted. Um, Open Tech Fund has a, a rolling application. It's not one time a year. They, so um, you can read the requirements, see how they do it, and just throw something in there. Be like, look, you know what? I, I have an idea. I have an idea. I want to do something. Or look, I don't have this idea. They have a couple different cool projects and, and funds that they're working on. but. You can say, I want to work on someone's idea because I have this particular skill. So like, you know, uh, I, I, I would love to do that. Uh, Mozilla, uh, Open Society, Ford Foundation, all these organizations, there, I can be that, that bridge for you. That's what I volunteer. Uh, hopefully, if I have 20,000 people sending me a message, that's a, a great problem to have uh, to help plug you in when you, once you figure out like, okay, I think I have an idea on how it works. But it's, it's a lot easier than you might think. Um, it does require, because there's not one clearinghouse for this data, a little bit of, of, of footwork and, and, and pounding that pavement, but I'm definitely happy to point you in the right direction once you have some thoughts on how you might want to do it, or, uh, if that makes sense. And oftentimes, our employers, uh, when I was working you know, in the private sector, they were able to say, you know what, we have a 5K walk that we would give you eight hours to do or 10 hours to clean up a park. Let's, we'll let you do that by helping this group or supporting this effort or being that advisor for what turned into 10 hours over, you know, 10 months or something like that. So a lot of times it doesn't even need to be something that disrupts your normal work. It could enhance uh, your normal work. Excellent. Yeah. And that's a, that's another good point too, as far as the, the, the incremental or, or I don't know if, if you're familiar with um, the good to great kind of uh, approach, right. um, the flywheel mentality where, 
just finding some kind of a small contribution will lead to more and lead to more. And you know, hopefully that becomes the kind of uh, the kind of momentum for each individual as well as for us as a, a community that we can use to, to build upon. And you can't achieve amazing, great strategic things without having those, those tiny little building blocks to get you there. That's right. I spent um, five years working on Crypto Harlem and just reach out to a university that's close and say, hey, do you have a cybersecurity program? What do you guys do? What do you know about what goes on with forensics? Um, I have so many mentees that I've met through that. And some of them are now like working for defense contractors or for nonprofits. And I'm so proud of all of them. Absolutely. It's kind of funny. I'm uh, keeping an eye on uh, some of the chats going on as well. Um, if For those of you who are asking, we've had actually quite a few questions in the vein of like, how do I get involved with this? Um, we actually have another talk coming up later in the agenda uh, where Lee Whitfield is going to be talking a lot about some of uh, some of the progresses, uh, some of the small progresses that we can make to try and do good and then scale that to do good at scale. Um, so lots of really good good talks that kind of interrelate. Um, you know, it's another testament to our advisory board of, of making sure we pick talks that are going to all work together in a lot of those ways. Um, Let's see, let me scroll down here. We've got just a couple more minutes for, um, you know, for some questions. People ask me how to get in touch. I'd actually like to take just a moment here to refer you to the individual uh, hallway channels that we have in Discord. Um, so Matt and all of our speakers will be spending some time after their respective talks in those channels. So if you've got specific questions that you know, we didn't get a chance to, to ask here, maybe it's a little bit more unique to your situation. You can certainly uh, head over there as well and, and give it, get a chance to, uh, to ask those questions and, uh, and get some of those resources. Like I, I see a couple of them about getting in touch and what else can they do to help. So those are, are things that you can ask there, of course. Um, let's see. Um, in terms of the URL that we've got up on the screen share right here, this is where uh, we're going to be doing the evaluations that I mentioned earlier. So if you can take a moment to pop over there, it certainly would be uh, helpful for us. Um, I just wanted to take a minute where we're kind of closing out and say, Matt, thank you so, so much for your time and, and sharing your passion and your experience with, with us. Um, you know, I gained a lot from it. I knew that a lot of the folks in the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the channel and in the, the broadcast have as well. Um, it's a, it's really fascinating to me to hear, you know, someone who has a very completely orthogonal path in, in your career compared to what I have and, and realize that even though we're, we're very different in a lot of those, those pathways, like there's some interesting parallels of finding ways to, uh, to do good. And, you know, it's uh, certainly inspiring to hear that as well. So thank you again for, uh, for, for the time it took to put this together. Absolutely. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Sands. Uh, thanks to everyone in the discord and everyone who's watching this. Um, I look forward to engaging with you and I, I, there, there's nothing that makes me happier than making it. So, after 365 days, this talk turned into something, something that you wanted to do or, or wanted to change. So thank you, everyone.